Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, hope you guys are doing well. I'm just getting the live stream underway here. It's pretty much uh, almost 9 a.m., but we got four more minutes. So good morning to you guys. I hope you're doing good. It's uh, Wednesday, May 13th, and we've got two review sessions to, uh, to go through. So you guys will help us cover a lot of these topics that are on the study guide. <clears throat> so get comfortable, get prepared, and we'll be going in a few minutes. <clears throat> be right back and get a drink. Hi, Eric. Good to see you. Um, next semester, I'm just teaching Intro to Philosophy again. Um, so, I mean, I guess you won't be able to take that class. Sometimes I've taught the Ethics class at Chapman and Logic, um, but for the fall, and Epistemology. But for this fall, it's just uh, intro, intro to Philosophy. So, I guess someone else is next up, but there will be a chance, I'm sure, in the future uh, for some different cor course offerings, maybe this um, the spring of the following year, so we'll see, but not in the fall. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> cool. Just another two minutes. Good morning, Hugh. Good to see you too. Mm -mm. Hi, Emily. Good to see you. Everybody up early. Getting the day to a good start, hopefully. <clears throat> Hey, Riley. <clears throat> nice. So we got a good core group so far. Hopefully we get a few more numbers. I don't want uh, just a couple people that have to do all the heavy lifting for the whole class, but what can I do? As we know, people are all spread out and some people in different time zones, so I guess it's fair. Plus we're getting to the end of the semester, so no surprise really. <clears throat> All right, well, you know, a um, few seconds remain, but let's just, I guess, get started and make the most use of our time. Hi, Trevor. Um, so you guys know it's the review session. We have two of them today and on Friday. So there's no more material to teach, but uh, there's a list of study guide questions that we can go over. Um, so basically what I'm hoping for you guys is that you have a copy of your study guide with you or that you have access to it um, on a web browser. And uh, you can just direct me to whichever questions you think we should talk about. And then I'll try to uh, expound on them a little bit and clarify the information so that everyone's got um, a good idea of, of the right kind of content. So um, let me know. Give me your questions, whatever the order is, whatever ones that you want me to address. If there's some of them in there that seem a little bit um, tougher for you, those would be the ones, I guess, to point out and focus on. Uh, but let me know. I'm just going to wait for your question. And um, I'm not looking at the list right now. I'm just going to refer to whatever you guys ask. So um, maybe you can type the question out or something like that in the, um, in the live chat. Okay, Riley, 
Explain how Gettier shows that justified true belief is not sufficient for knowledge. Good. So the way that he shows that is by providing some examples where a person has a justified true belief, but that they still don't have knowledge. Okay. So basically, um, in the examples of Gettier, Gettier case one and case two, the individual provided in the example has a justified true belief, and yet it's not a case of knowledge, which demonstrates that the classical definition is not fully satisfactory, that it's not sufficient, because you can meet all the conditions and still not know. Uh, hey, Logan. And so you would want to, in that case of that question, you would have to pre pretty much go over the details of at least one of the Gettier cases. Like, for example, if you went into the first one, this is the one about Smith and Jones that are trying to get a certain job. And um, the boss of the company tells Smith during a private moment, hey, Smith, I'm actually going to hire Jones instead of you. So Smith now believes Jones will get the job. Okay, subsequently, Smith asks Jones, how many coins are in your pocket? And he counts them, and he sees that there's 10. So now he has these two bits of information. Jones will get the job, and Jones has 10 coins in his pocket. So from that, he deduces the proposition that the man who gets the job has 10 coins in his pocket. And now we can see that that's a justified belief. That's a justified belief because he has evidence that Jones will get the job, and he has evidence that Jones has 10 coins in his pocket. So he can add those two things up and come to the conclusion that the man who gets the job has 10 coins in his pocket. Okay, now at the end of the story, there's a little plot twist. The boss comes back, and maybe you can remember the way it goes. The boss tells um, Smith, surprise Smith, I actually was kidding, I'm, gonna ha I'm hiring you instead of Jones. Okay, and then what's the uh, extra little additional point that gets mentioned? Smith happens to have in his own pocket 10 coins also, which he was not aware of and which he had not counted on his own. So what can we say at the end? The statement that the man who gets the job has 10 coins in his pocket did turn out to be true. Um, and it was already believed by Smith, and he had reason to believe it, so it was justified. Therefore, it's a justified true belief. But no one would say that it sounds as if it is a case of knowledge, because the reason that it is true has nothing to do with the evidence that he was judging the proposition to be true based on. So it's just luck. It's just a coincidence that it turned out to be true based on the way that he established the belief. Okay, so that would be one case. The other case was um, the Brown and Barcelona example. So in, in the second version, Smith and Jones are working in one office, and um, Smith believes that Jones owns a Ford car because he says that he does, and he shows up to work in such a car. So he believes that Jones owns a Ford, and he's justified. Then he forms three beliefs that use that as the first component of a disjunction, which is an or statement. So he has these three beliefs, either Brown, sorry, either Jones owns a Ford or Brown is in Boston, either Jones owns a Ford or Brown is in Barcelona, either Jones owns a Ford or Brown is in brest And although he has no idea where Brown is at, he actually happens to coincidentally be in Barcelona. And also, despite all the appearances to the contrary, Jones does not own a Ford and he's just renting one and lying about that he owns it. So the second statement that either Jones owns a Ford or Brown is in Barcelona ends up being true and once again, although it was believed by Smith with good reason, one would say that it's not evident, sorry, that it's not knowledge, uh, because although it's a justified true belief, it's just a matter of coincidence that it turned out to be true, because he was basing his evidence on the false information about Jones owning, owning a Ford, whereas what makes it true is the fact that he has no knowledge of, which is that Brown's in Barcelona. Okay, and there's a lot of other Gettier cases too, like the case of the person who sees um, a, a hallucination elephant and while they're on drugs, so they think there's an elephant in the room, and it happens that there actually is an elephant, but it's like hidden away in a closet. Um, in that case, they would have a justified true belief, but not knowledge. Okay, so different examples of Gettier cases. The most classic one would probably be the first one with this job hunt. Now we have Emily's question. Okay, so a few things to cover, so let's do them one by one. First of all, Emily. Good. Thank you, guys. So uh, explain Descartes' method of doubt. What's known for certain, even when the method is being applied? How long should the answers be, Eric? They should be as long as possible. 
Um, how long can you go? That's how long. So, but by the way, Emily, Descartes' method of doubt. What's known for certain even when the method's being applied and why? Okay, so the method of doubt is a method that Descartes uses to try and determine what is certain. He thinks that the only way that you're going to discover what is certain is by setting aside all the things that could possibly be doubted. So the method says, assume that things are false if there's any possibility that they could be, right? Okay, so what's known for certain even when the method's being applied? Well, one thing that we cannot say for sure is that their external world exists because everything that you perceive by the five senses could just be a dream. He even thinks that math and logic could be false if there were like an evil demon that wanted to deceive you about those things too. Um, but the one thing that's known for certain even when the method is being applied is simply that you exist uh, because you're thinking. So, for example, right now, don't you believe you exist? Even if you were dreaming, you would know that you're existing because you're having thoughts. So I think, therefore, I am. That's the one thing you can't doubt, your existence, not mine or anybody else's. That's something you can doubt. But for as long as you're thinking about anything, right, so Garrett Hardin said that um, we don't have a moral obligation to assist the global poor, and he gives this metaphor or scenario of a lifeboat to try and make this point. So basically, um, imagine there's a lifeboat with a limited capacity to carry people. Maybe it can carry a maximum of uh, 60 people, and there's 50 people there, so it's extra room for 10. But you've got 100 people that are in the water, each of them wants to get on this boat for some kind of safety and security, but basically you can't take all of them on the boat because that will cause the boat to sink. Um, even if you took 10, that would max out the boat and make it less safe. So the way that uh, Hardin argues is that you better not let anybody on the boat. And this is a metaphor. The boat is supposed to be a representation of like wealthy countries. The people that are in the water that are more numerous are supposed to be the poor people of the world, um, and the fact that they would like to gain passage on the boat is supposed to represent our ability to provide some assistance or help. But basically what he's saying is any attempt to do it, well-intentioned though it may be, would just undermine our own position and over time become unsustainable. So that was his um, example of the lifeboat. And then the tragedy of the commons, Hugh, this was just the idea stated by Garrett Hardin that if you make something a public resource, it will not work out in the end because everyone will take from the resource since it's available to all, but nobody will do anything to maintain uh, the sustainability of the resource because it does not belong to them personally. So that means everyone will draw from it, won't contribute to it, and therefore it will quickly be overrun and destroyed through overuse and poor management. He gives the case of an acre of land. And if there was an acre of farmland that was private, the private owner would take care of it because they don't want to lose the value of what they bought. But if you make that same acre open to public for the farming, then everyone will bring their animals. It will quickly get overgrazed. Nobody will do anything to maintain its upkeep. And therefore, you lose the value of that one acre. And he says this is something that happens across the board with any public resource, which is one reason that he advises not to support uh, institutions like the World Food Bank which would create a commons uh, in terms of global access to public store of food. Okay, um, so that would be those two. Okay, Hugh, so then next up, Trevor, for 41, explain the classical account of knowledge. Yes, the classical account of knowledge is justified true belief. You would have to talk about what each of the conditions is uh, and give examples. So for a statement to be true, it has to match what's going on in reality. Um, for a statement to be believed, it has to be such that the individual thinks that the statement is true or that matches reality. And then for it to be justified, somebody just has to have good reasons or evidence to back up what they do believe. Um, if all three are con conditions are met, then someone has knowledge. If even one of them is not met, then a person does not have knowledge. So you could also talk about how in an example where a person's belief is false, that's not eligible to be knowledge or in an example where someone has a true belief but no reason to think it's true, that's also not a case of knowledge. Um, so yeah, you'd have to detail the conditions, maybe give some examples of what counts as satisfying the conditions. You could give an example also if you liked of um, 
why it's not enough unless all of them are met. So like a case where like maybe two out of the three conditions are met, but not the third. Um, that's pretty much it. So imitation game, Eric. Uh, well, the imitation game is given by Alan Turing to try and explore the question whether computers or machines could ever think or could have consciousness. So um, the way the game is played, and you have to talk about how to sort of play the game if this was the question that I asked you. So you have to talk about the way of setting it up. Basically, you have to establish a partition. On one side of it, there is one interrogator. And on the other side of it, you have a human and a computer. OK. Now, the interrogator has to ask questions to the two subjects, the human and the computer, in two separate interviews that he conducts. The questions that he asks and the answers that he receives are, are all delivered via text. OK? And he can't see who's on the other side of the wall. So he has to judge after the interview is done, which of the two subjects was the human and which was the computer. Now, what Turing said is that if we ever get to a point, in his view actually, when we get to a point where um, the interrogator fails to correctly identify these cases about half of the time, if and when we get to that point, that's when machines should be considered as thinking things, as conscious beings. Um, because at that point, the ability to distinguish their behavior from real human behavior is impossible. So if you can't tell the difference between the human and the computer in these in interviews at about 50% of the time, then that's a thinking machine that has consciousness. Okay, so Turing believed machines could think if they could pass this test. Um, now, what's next here? So the net methodological naturalism argument, Riley, that was one argument that was stated by um, Daniel Stoljar. And Daniel Stoljar's essay is an essay in favor of physicalism. So this is an argument that's given to try and boost up and support physicalism. All right, so what it says is simply that it's reasonable to believe what's believed by the methods of natural science. Um, and physicalism is believed by the methods of natural science. So therefore, physicalism is reasonable for you to believe. Yeah, um, it's an easy enough argument. It just says, when you believe what scientists do, that's a reasonable thing to believe. And scientists happen to believe in physicalism, so it follows that that's reasonable to believe. Um, okay, and I'm just going in the order I see questions appear in this list, so what's next? Olivia, you're asking the, soon he will be in the past, uh, according to David Lewis. Okay, so David Lewis's article is about the paradoxes of time travel. He says there that, um, you know, uh, time travel is not impossible, even though there's some aspects of it that sound really weird and that make it seem like it might be impossible, but it's actually not. And so one of the possible problems that he wants to try and explain is that you could give statements uh, in a time travel scenario that would sound like, um, like nonsense, like, okay, in 10 minutes, I'll be in 1970. That sounds like what are you saying? Because in the, it sounds like in the future you'll be in the past. Well, how can a person make sense of the statement, soon I will be in the past? By utilizing the, no, the notion of two different um, time frames. He talks about personal time versus external time. Okay, so personal time is just the time experienced by the time traveling individual, and it's the sort of time that would be measured and shown on their wristwatch if they kept one on their wrist the whole time. External time is the time which is um, experienced and measured by all external observers and clocks. So when a person says soon I will be in the past, like for example in five minutes I'll be um, watching the moon landing in 1969, the way of interpreting this would be to say that in five minutes of personal time going forward I'll be 51 years negative in external time. So um, the dis the divergence between the amount of personal and external time is exactly predicted by Einstein's theory of relativity, which says that we do occupy our own individual time frames. They just generally coincide because we are bounded on the Earth and cannot really move at such different speeds. Um, so there you go. External and personal time is the uh, pair of concepts 
that Lewis uses to make sense of weird statements like, soon he will be in the past. Okay, now, um, Ella, the question of supervenience. So supervenience was mentioned in uh, some of our recent articles, the one by Daniel Stoljar in Philosophy of Mind. So um, Stoljar is a physicalist. Physicalism is the position that everything's physical, everything, not just some things, but every single thing, including the mind, including your consciousness. Um, so if everything's physical, um, what does this mean? Supervenience is given to try and explain what it does mean to say that everything's physical. So supervenience is explained via the example of a dot matrix picture. So you have to consider a dot matrix picture. It's made out of a bunch of tiny dots of ink, which when they combine together, they form this big picture image. Okay, so <clears throat> in a dot matrix, if you had got two of them, which are the same exact arrangement of dots, then they would have the same global features. The word global feature just refers to a large aspect of this composite image. Um, so now if you had, again, two dot matrices, which were the same exact arrangement uh, and ordering of dots, then they would have to have the same global features in common. Okay, now in the physical universe, which is kind of like comparable to these dot matrix images, we have um, objects all around us and us ourselves made out of atoms. So the atoms are kind of like the logical equivalent of the dots in the dot matrix. And the things formed by the atoms, like objects, events, and so on, those are like the equivalent of the global features seen in the dot matrix. So side by side with the explanation I just gave, if there are, for example, if there were two universes in which the atomic facts are exactly the same, then they would both have the same global features as well, including all aspects of human consciousness. So basically your consciousness and mine and everything else in this big universe is just the result of a bunch of little atoms pieced together in a given way. And it's nothing that could not be reproduced in another possible physical system with the same um, assortment of atoms. Okay, Trevor, the uh, question you're asking though is not written correctly. I think you gotta look at the list again and, and reformulate the number 50. Uh, it doesn't say that. Um, okay, so Hugh, two similarities between time and space according to Ted Sider. Good, so um, According to Ted Sider, time and space are much more similar than is often thought. Um, sometimes people think that um, they're way different, but according to the space-time theory, they're united together, they're integrated into one thing, and they really do have significant similarities. So he states three. Um, one is in terms of reality. That just means that no matter how far away an object is in space, it's still just real, as, as real as it is when it's close to you. So the distance from the observer doesn't change how real a physical object is in space. And the same is true of time and distance. So the distance from the present that a moment is doesn't affect how real it is. So in other words, um, a moment in time that's way out in the future is just as real as this moment you're having here. And moments in the past, like from your earlier life or from even before you were born, those moments still exist in space-time. Nothing goes away. It's all there all the time. All the moments are just fully um, set forth in the space-time structure. So distance doesn't change how real something is. The second one was in terms of parts. So objects take up space by having uh, space parts, spatial parts. And then objects take up time by having temporal parts. A temporal part is an object at a moment of time. So um, according to space-time theory, we are made up of both kinds of parts. We extend through space and occupy mass because we have spatial parts. And we endure through time and have some duration because we've got temporal parts. And then the third similarity was in terms of the words here and now. The similarity there is that um, both are relative terms. The reference of the location here 
depends on just where a speaker is when they say the word. And the reference of the time denoted by the word now just stands for whenever the person used the word. So spoken of by me, um, here, um, my, my cat is here. You know, I, that's true when I say it because she's actually right there. Um, but in your apartment, you would not say uh, Professor Vulich's cat is here. So what's the right answer? Is she here or is she not here? Well, there's two different here's. And so the word here doesn't only refer to one location, it's depending on who speaks. Same with now. Okay, so those are the similarities between time and space. The question asks for two, the, the textbook refers to three, so you could just take whichever of those three that you wanted. Um, cool, so then, Trevor, why does the con, why, uh, explain why the concept of time moving is a paradox, okay. Um, Cider tries to make this point that it's really not so easy to explain what is meant by the statement that time moves. Um, in order for something to move through space, that has to be at different places at different times. So the concept of time is already involved in a general definition of movement or motion. So if things move when they change their position over time by being at different places at different times, then how could time possibly move? If time itself moves, then that invites the analysis. It does so by being at different places at different times. But now we're using time in the definition of time, which is circular. Um, if you try to say that time moves because the present moment is moving, that you know, at, at one point the present is uh, 9.22 a.m., at a later time 12 noon is present, at a later time 3 p.m. is present, you could try and characterize it that way, but he says this doesn't really fare any better because you're still saying that the present moment is moving through time. You know, like the present moment is at different places at different times. And yet again, then, a reference to time is indicated in an analysis of the concept itself. So that's circularity. That's an infinite regress kind of thing, which doesn't make sense and is not uh, logical. Therefore, he says a better approach is to claim that time does not move. And it just sits there like space. Um, so that's pretty much it for that one. Well, what else? We got more questions, I think. Um, so let's just hear what you want to talk about. By the way, let me make sure that this is clear. I, I think I said it before, but um, don't forget to uh, do your course evaluations if you can. Um, uh, the response rate for our class is a little low. Um, the hour after this is like twice as much. So I mean, it probably has to do with the fact that we're a little earlier group, but um, uh, it's not a big concern, but I would really appreciate it and that'd be helpful. So if you didn't get a chance, please just do me a solid and um, fill that out if you, if you have a moment later in the week or today, okay? Because I think the window of opportunity closes on Friday for that. So I know it's something that you don't have to do, um, but it would be nice. Okay, um, next up, the Descartes example of the wax. Okay, so Riley, what he's saying there is, um, when you look at a piece of wax at a given moment in time and you perceive it with your five senses, what you're seeing about it there is just something non-essential to it. Um, so like he gives the example that the wax at one initial time is blue, it um, smells like flowers, it's hard to the touch, it's cold to the touch, it also will make a sound if you hit it with your knuckle, and um, it tastes like honey. But if you exposed it to a high flame, really powerful flame, then it's going to lose all those same qualities. So it will no longer appear blue. Uh, it'll you know, no longer smell nice uh, like flowers. It, it won't taste the same way. It you know, won't um, feel the same way to the tactile uh, sense. So look, it lost all those qualities, but the wax still does exist. And therefore, if you want to think about what the most essential qualities of the wax are, you should think about the things that have not changed in the uh, interval from the first to the second time. And those are just simple facts like this, that it remains extended in space. That is, that it just takes up some volume of space. That it is extent, that it is um, flexible, meaning that it could be reconfigured into different outward forms. And that it is changeable, meaning that it can undergo alteration of its attributes. Now, those are the deep essential qualities of the wax, which are not necessarily perceived with the senses, but are understood by the intellect. So it's kind of Descartes' attempt to say that when it comes to physical objects, um, 
the most essential aspects of them are better understood through the mind than the five senses. The five senses only give us a kind of temporary um, snapshot in time of what the thing is like, and it only discloses to us its non-essential qualities. Okay. Um, now, Hume, Turing's response to the idea that a machine, unlike a human, can only do what it's been programmed to do. Okay, so going back to um, Alan Turing, keep in mind that he said um, these machines are going to be thinking things when they pass this Turing test. You know, when they can um, make the inter interrogator think that it's a human um, about half the time, then we should consider them as con conscious beings. Now, some say in reaction to that, no, no, they're never going to really have consciousness because it doesn't matter uh, how realistic their statements are and how um, human-like the quality of the interaction is. They're not really conscious because all they are doing is acting out a computer program that was um, implanted into them. They're not really having original thoughts. They're not actually having any kind of um, unique human consciousness that we have because we do all kinds of random stuff that is unpredictable and spontaneous, but a computer program is locked into what the program is, and so it cannot do anything besides what it's programmed to do. Therefore, it's not really conscious. Now, the question here is about how the Turing replied back to that. So you'd want to mention what the criticism was and now his response. His response is that um, <clears throat> we are the same, basically. We're not any different from the computers because there's nothing that we can think about that we have not already been exposed to before. So, like, um, you know, if there's, a, if there's a great novel or something that other people have read and you have not yet read it, you're not able right now to discuss the plot, the characters, or anything else. If there's a film uh, that hasn't been released yet to the public, and there has not been any media reporting on it, I know you can't be thinking of that film right now um, until you watch it or until it's shown to you. Um, this information about Turing itself is stuff that now you can talk about having been taught about it, but prior to that you could not have. So you can look at the human brain as a very powerful computing system too, which has not got the ability to think about things aside from what it acquires from the environment and from external sources. So in Turing's mind, the objection falls flat because it's not really a significant difference. The human brain is also constrained by the limitations of its program. Okay, so now Olivia, two possible differences between killing and failing to assist. Yeah, so if we go back to the first half of the class and we're talking about um, Peter Singer, Peter Singer said that if you don't help the global poor, and you're living in the first world and you're you know, a citizen of the first world like us, then that means that you're deficient in your moral responsibilities to assist the poor. And um, could that be something that's anywhere in the ballpark of actually killing? He knows, though, that there are differences between killing and failing to assist. And so mentioned in that discussion is this difference that, um, well, I guess I have to tell you what the differences are. So he said there can be difference of motivation difference in certainty the outcome, identifiability of the victim, not hard to avoid killing, but hard to save all the lives that you can. And then the last fifth one was that um, you can always say it's not my fault that they're poor, but you could not say something similar in the case of killing. So those are five stated differences, and each one has its own explanation. Um, so there's a little more detail that could also be given. The difference of motive. The killer wants to kill people, when you don't uh, give money to the poor, though, that's not because you want anybody to be hurt. It's just because you're probably not even thinking about the poor and just focused on the benefit that you get from spending the money on whatever it is that you want to spend it on. So there's a different motive there. Um, certainty of the outcome. A person who sets out to kill, sadly, it, with a high likelihood, is going to at least hurt somebody. But when you fail to assist, it's not so certain, perhaps, that that's going to really lead to harm because there's always room for doubt about the effectiveness of the aid agency and the way it disperses money. Um, not hard to avoid killing, but hard to save all the lives that you could. The point there is that maybe there is a big difference between killing and failing to assist because it's so easy to not kill, but it's not easy to, to, to give assistance. Not killing people means doing nothing, leaving people alone, minding your own business. 
So it doesn't require you to even get up off of your chair. Um, but assisting people does require you to at least write a check or give some kind of time or energy to a cause. So you could say they're not equivalent. Helping people takes time and energy. Not killing people takes nothing. And then like, um, did I talk about identifiability of the victim? Yeah, so if a person kills, they kill specific people and their identities are clear. But when you fail to assist, there's no clear way that we could assign responsibility to you for any particular person's death. Like, uh, you know, it's not the same as having been a killer and having de definitive victims. And then finally, um, the poor people of the world existed before any of us were born. And so you could argue that that's not really a problem which I caused. So I don't have any, more, uh, any responsibility to fix this problem. But if I kill people, then it's a problem that I did cause by definition. So you could argue that that's a different level of responsibility too. Um, I don't have an obligation to fix problems that I'm not the cause of, but I have to take responsibility for problems that I did cause. So there's another possible difference. Okay, so um, so far so good, I think, covering a lot of information. Got a little more time today, so I'll just see what you have next. <clears throat> Grandfather paradox. Okay, so a little bit more on this time travel subject. Um, David Lewis wrote the paradoxes of time travel. One of the issues that mention, he mentions in that essay is, is this a paradox of time travel? The whole idea of whether a uh, person could go back and basically change the past in some way to a way that it didn't ha happen originally. So the scenario that he gives for that is that there's this person named Tim. Basically, um, I'll, I'll tell you next, Marissa, but basically Tim wants to kill his grandfather, even though his grandfather's not in, alive anymore, but he wants to go back in time and kill him when, his, and when he was in his prime. So he takes a time machine, goes back to 1950 or whatever year, and he sees his grandfather back then when he was a young guy. Now, the grandfather, he's trying to kill him before he ever um, fathered the parent of Tim. And so obviously that introduces all kinds of problems because since Tim clearly was born in this universe, the events that led to his birth have to happen. Otherwise, he would never have been capable of entering a time machine because his birth would have been canceled. Um, so when he goes back into the past, the question is, can he succeed in killing his grandfather? It seems like no, because that would contradict the timeline of the events which led him to get in the machine in the first place. Um, on the other hand, though, just being there and having the will to do that makes it seem like he can. In the end, David Lewis says the only consistent ending to the scenario is to say that he won't be capable of succeeding, but that doesn't mean that he can't try and fail. Um, he also mentions that the term can in a way is ambiguous between two interpretations, the narrower and the broader interpretation of can. Sometimes when we say what a person can do, we're talking about the narrow sense, meaning just concerning a narrow range of factors. Sometimes when we talk about what a person can or can't do, we're taking a big picture, um, broad set of factors. So according to the narrow sense of can, it looks like he can succeed just because he's there, but according to the broad sense of can, it seems like no, he can't, because we already know how the story ends with his birth. So in a way, we kind of get to have it both ways, depending on which sense of the term can is being employed. But for real, he says he's not going to be able to succeed. Okay. Um, now, Marissa, you're asking how many questions would be on the final. Um, the midterm was, I think, you had to answer six questions for me. But you were given a pretty short window of time, you know, the class period of an hour. And this one's two and a half hours. So I'm not going to add a ton more, but I will add a few more. So I think it could be something like eight questions out of a set of maybe, I don't know, like 11 or 12. Um, so that's basically it. I'll select from the list set number of uh, items, and then you'll have to answer about eight of them. Um, I'll, I'll select more from the second half of the list, but I will throw in a couple from the first half too to keep it cumulative. Okay. Now, uh, Hugh. Um, Questions, not 19 and 20. 19. Explain the test that Everett suggests for gaining evidence that a certain type of being does not exist. And then 20. How is the actual world not appropriate as expression of God's intentions, according to Everett? Okay, so Nicholas Everett wrote Theism in Modern Science. Yes, thanks. Um, Theism in Modern Science. 
That's an article which explores the tensions that lie between religion and science. And um, in making his essay, he gives this argument that the universe we are in does not really, in his mind, seem to be the type of universe that God would have created if he did exist and created it. So the test was basically, if there is a being with certain nature and certain intentions, then in that case, this being would produce certain changes in the world. But if, second premise, but if the world, uh, say the world does not display those changes, therefore we could make the conclusion that there's evidence that the being doesn't exist. So like he gave an example of a person who's shipwrecked on an island and wants to determine if there are any other um, survivors that made their way to the island too. Now, in that case, the way the filling in of the argument would go is, if there is another survivor who's like me, who wants to be discovered, then he'll do certain things on the island. But if he goes throughout the island looking for those behaviors like tracks, trails, sounds, enclosures, crude tools, fire pit, you know, if he goes through the whole island looking for any signs of those kind of things, signs of life from another person, doesn't see any signs, now he has evidence that there is actually no other person there. Okay. So the format of the argument is, if there was some type of being, then they would likely do certain things. But if you don't see those things that they would do, then maybe they don't even exist. Like in my own case, I talked to you guys about as a child, uh, Santa Claus. I was skeptical, uh, even as a kid, about Santa. And so I thought, well, if he, is, if he exists, right, and he wants to deliver these gifts to me, then basically I'll be able to hear and see certain evidence of that if I just observe the chimney all night on Christmas. I would hear ho, ho, ho. I would hear the pitter pat of the ho reindeer uh, hooves. Uh, you know, I should hear the sleigh bells ringing and all of that, but whatever. I didn't see any of those things, so I reached the conclusion that maybe that actually wasn't real. Now, okay, that's the kind of argument, but now it flows right into your next question there, Hugh, which is 20. When he talks about God, he says, if God created this universe for us, for humans, right? Because the Bible and, you know, mainstream religions of the world say that. Uh, God didn't just randomly create us, that he had a particular um, thought in mind, that we would be like in his image and that we would be like special and over and beyond the rest of the creation, humans. So if God did that, create this universe just for us, then according to Everett, you'd expect the universe to exhibit certain features. Like, for example, you'd think that it would all be on a human scale. So we should be in the center. It shouldn't be way larger than us, the universe. And... Um, we should have appeared really way back early in time and not that long after the other animals. But as Everett says, science indicates that none of that is true. Not only are we not in the center of the universe, but we're very small in this giant universe. And uh, we did not appear early in the history of the universe, nor did we appear right after other animals, but much, much later in time. So those are the things that he says kind of serve as the... Um, you know, not seeing the signs that you would have expected in case the being did exist. Okay, there. So then Ella, Noological Dangler. That one's pretty easy. So J.J. C. Smart, one of our recent authors in Philosophy of Mind, he utilizes this term. It just refers to something that is unexplained, that remains unanswered or unexplained by science. Um, so basically... Science doesn't like these nomological danglers because it represents something that they don't understand yet. And um, in his mind, if dualism were true, then in that case, um, consciousness would be this nomological dangler because it would be something detached from the physical. It would be something other than a physical process of the brain. So JJC Smart says that's not really true. It is just a brain process. Consciousness and everything having to do with your thoughts and feelings, those are just brain states. And if they weren't, if they were some mysterious soul or spirit, then they would be nomological danglers, which he says are not preferred by science, of course. Um, now, Hugh, your question, will quotations and citations be required? No. Um, only for essays is that, I think, a good practice, yes. But for a um, timed um, exam, no, I wouldn't insist on that. You, you don't need to use the book. Um, of course, I know many of you probably will. But um, no, that's not a requirement, um, at least not on these exams, which under the time pressure that you have, I don't want you to think that you're like compiling a formally uh, produced essay, uh, but they should be precise and detailed answers, yes. Okay, so next up, um, Riley. 
Um, sorry, jumping off of 65, would that be in favor of dualism or against? Let's be very, very clear. JJC Smart is not a dualist. He says sensations are brain processes, so that's physical. He's saying that nomological danglers are bad and dumb or something like that. No, there's no nomological danglers. He's claiming that other people say consciousness is a nomological dangler. And his view is, no, it's not. It's just the brain. So the brain is physical, and the brain is something that can be understood through neuroscience. So he rejects the idea that there are any nomological danglers. There are no such things as nomological danglers. Everything can be explained by science, 100% of everything. The consciousness that we have is not something separate from physical universe and physical laws. Um, so I just want to make that clear because I've noticed that some people um, reporting on that got confused. You know, some people say that JJC Smart um, is like a dualist or that he believes he believes consciousness is a nomological dangler, but no, he does not. He's just providing the definition of the term nomological dangler so that he can contrast what other people say about consciousness with what a physicalist like himself says. Okay. Now, um, why does Plato say that injustice can't benefit you? Okay, so Plato has this very detailed account of how your soul is built up. He says that there's three parts of it. There's the appetite part, the spirit part, like the passionate competitive part, and then there's the rational part that is like wise and makes good decisions. Um, yeah, no, it's good, so that's good. Um, we got these three parts of our soul, and they should work together cooperatively, and we should let, allow the smart and reasonable part to run everything and not try to challenge it or, uh, or overthrow it. Now, um, what about, though, if you could be unjust and no one would know about it, wouldn't, could that be to your benefit? Socrates, Plato, they say no. Injustice doesn't benefit anybody, even, though, even the people that get away clean and nobody ever finds out what they did do. You know, so people that are just cheating, cheating, lying, lying, stealing, stealing, ripping people off, and no one knows they did it, and they're getting off scot-free, they're not doing well. That's not benefiting them. And here's why. He says they're kind of harming themselves inside in, in terms of their soul. He gives the example of this three-headed creature. So you would have to probably mention that. The three-headed creature is a situation where there's like one lion head, a bunch of little gargoyles, and then a human head. And he says if everybody just sees the human face from the outside looking in, they'll just think everything's normal. But if what's going on in the inside is that the lion and the gargoyles are attacking the human and making it cower in fear, then that means that inside this person's life's not really going well because the rationality within them is being suppressed by their overpowering passions and appetites. So you're not supposed to allow um, your passions and appetites to run the show because otherwise uh, your parts of the soul are going to be at war with each other, vying for control struggling for supremacy. Therefore, a person who's unjust um, puts their soul at, and the parts of it at war with each other. Therefore, they're living with a state of internal conflict. And it doesn't matter whether anybody knows about that or not. That's just what's really happening to them. So their life is not as good and healthy and happy as it would be if the parts of the soul were properly harmonized and in the correct order. Okay. So there's this creature metaphor that helps to advance his point on that. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, whatever else. Let's, we have a little time left. It's not a lot of time left. Uh, so you say now, Marissa, would it be fair to say that injustice cannot benefit you because you feed the inhumane heads and thus corrupt your humanity? Uh, yes, I mean, that's true. But to say this, um, context has to be provided, like what are the heads in the first place, and what is the description given by the author, like others don't see the three, but inside there really are the three, you know, and inside they fight with each other because they don't agree to be submissive to the rule of the reason. Um, so, you know, when you do bad things, like if you wanted to cheat, it, it would be because um, you had such an appetite for the, for the good grade that like it caused you to not do the right thing. If you uh, got into a fight, it would be because you're not listening to your better judgment and you just let your um, emotions and anger or whatever get the best of you. So when you do bad things uh, that don't benefit you or don't benefit other people, it's because the lower parts of your soul have stepped out of their lane and are trying to take over um, for the intellect and, and to lead. 
but they shouldn't leak because they don't have wisdom. So allow your wisdom to rule and things will go well. But if you don't, then you're going to make it weak. You're going to get it overwhelmed and overpowered by the other parts. And every time it tries to exert some influence or control, it's going to be reprimanded by the lower parts of the soul. Do you really want to live like that? I would hope not. That's what he's saying. Uh, you shouldn't want and it wouldn't be good for you anyway, even if you thought you wanted it. Okay. So Trevor, um, explain Sark's example of the student who asked him for advice during World War II. Um, yeah, so Sartre is an existentialist, and he thought that um, basically you're in control of your own essence and creating your own identity. So you make yourself um, in whatever way you want based on your free will and your choices. Um, he thinks there's no fact about how a person should live apart from how they are living because each one of us chooses our own uh, life and our own path. And that means that when we do that, we believe in what we're doing because why else would we have chosen it? So, um, so each one of us places our own example in this world as the way we think people should live lives. So your own life is like an example that you're building um, of what you think the right kind of way to live is. Um, now, because of that, when you have to make choices between things, you're ultimately left with your own freedom and judgment. No other outside force can make those choices for you uh, because it just depends on your own sense of the right choice. So when the student came to Sartre, they said, Sartre, professor, my mom's basically getting really sick. I want to stay with her and help her. But also there's World War II happening, and I want to go and fight in the army and help defend my country. But um, I can't do both. And if I do one, then I'm going to regret that I didn't do the other. So can you help me choose? This is a tough dilemma. And, you know, Sartre would have told him and did say, I cannot make the choice for your choice. Um, so basically, he just throws him back onto his own free will and judgment. And that's how all choice decisions are made in existentialist thought. No objective fact about what's the right action, just individual will and decision, which claims of the decision that's right for that person. Okay. Um, and I guess, Hugh, I kind of touched on your question too just now. By creating yourself, you create the example that you would hope people will follow. Even if they don't follow it, you're following your own example by definition, right? So when you create this one individual person that you are, that is also your kind of like example of how you think the human should generally live. So like if I choose to be a Christian, then I'm choosing it for myself, but I'm also saying this at the same time. Anybody else who does that is making a good choice because it's the same one that I did make. So you like you value and you approve of the kind of choices that you make in your life. Therefore, in case other members of humanity make the same type of choices, they're automatically approved of by you. So you kind of create a paradigm, a picture of a good human being's life just by looking at your own situation and your own choices, okay? So like, I mean, I majored in philosophy and chose this path to be a professor. Um, if other people do that, I don't have a problem with that. In fact, I think that's great because wouldn't I be a hypocrite to say it's, it's a great thing for me, um, but it's a bad thing for others. Um, you know, I know that there's other people with different perspectives and if they choose other things, then that means they have those values bound up with those things. So our individual decisions kind of stand for how we think people should choose in general. Okay, um, that's really it for today. I know we've gotten now to the last minute of our first review session. So uh, let's be back on Friday, okay? And we'll do one more round and we'll get some more questions covered if we can. Um, thank you guys for participating. You know, try to attend on Friday. The more of us that are here, the better for the benefit of you and all the other students too. Um, and please, if you have a chance to do those evaluations, that would be great. So thanks again. I'm working through your essays and I'll let you guys know in a few days when they're ready. But for now, um, have a good one and take care. I'll see you back on Friday. Bye-bye. <clears throat>